the second keynote speaker amongst us. Let me introduce sir to all of you uh, present here, uh, dear dignitaries, guests, students, faculties, uh, to Dr. Devujit Palit. Uh, he is a PhD in energy policy, former director and senior fellow, Rural Energy and Livelihoods Division in Kerry, vice president, honorary vice president in Indian Association for Energy Economics, and of course, and also a visiting faculty at Anand National University. Uh, Dr. Palit has more than 25 years of experience working in the field of renewable energy, clean energy access, rural electrification, decentralized energy, many trees, energy gender, poverty nexus, and water energy food access. Um, he had been listed in the top 20% world scientists, an uh, um, um, astounding achievement for two, 2019 and 2020 by Stanford University and Elsevier. Uh, during his association with Terry from 1998 to March 2022, he has executed nearly 200 analytical and action research and implementation projects and uh, handled around 70 projects as a principal investigator or as a team lead in the field of clean energy technology, resource assessment, and energy planning. Uh, of course, there are uh, other topics like that of decentralized energy project implementation, rural electrification policy and regulation, monitoring, evaluation, and impact assessment, and capacity building. So, till very recently, he was leading the rural energy and livelihood divisions in Terry as a director and senior fellow. He's also the vice president, uh, honorary vice president of the Indian Association for Energy Economics, and also a part of various expert groups, committees, such as LDTC distribution systems, sectional committees, steered by the Bureau of Indian Standards, Ministry of New and Renewable Energy Committee for benchmark costs for the decentralized solar applications and working group, uh, WGC 6.38 of CIGRA. Earlier, he was also a member of the technical committee of the decentralized distributed generation scheme under the National Rural Electrification Program of the Government of India. Dr. Palit possesses vast national and international experience working the projects for UN organization, bilateral organizations, the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, and federal government across 17 countries in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. He has also written widely on energy access and rural electrification issues and has published three books and around 145 research papers in peer-reviewed journals, conference proceedings, books, and magazines and newspapers. Of course, that goes no doubt in saying that he's the most sought-out speaker on rural and renewable energy issues, rural electrifications and energy transition, water energy food, energy poverty livelihood, and energy gender poverty nexus, and has participated in more than 100 conferences and workshops across Asia, Africa, Europe, and America. Uh, I mean, to name, I think, few, we're just touching the globe all together. So in fact, this is like, we are, we are absolutely privileged to have you amongst us uh, to be as the keynote speaker today. The floor is all yours, sir. The floor is all yours. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Dr. Bhattacharji, and uh, thank you, KG Somaya Institute, and uh, my friend, Dr. Hipu Nathan, for, uh, for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts. So what I do is that I will, uh, let me share the screen. Yeah, so what I do is that I will, uh, so I was very still very recently till yesterday I was part of Terry. So today I am not part of Terry, uh, but then the work that we have done in Terry uh, over the last uh, many years, uh, about uh, three four years, on India's energy transition, the road ahead. So I'm going to share some of the major findings from the work that I have done as part of my uh, PhD work, uh, which is. Uh, on rural electrification and the energy transition work that was done at Terry by me and my colleagues. So, so basically, I would like to share with you a summary of the findings that uh, of the type of transition that is have, 
that appears to be taking place or will take place in India. Uh, this one. So I will spend about 25 to 30 minutes and then probably can take few questions uh, and, and to have a good deliberation. Well, so, so let me set the context first uh, before, because it's important to understand the context first before we proceed to certain findings or conclusion. So uh, just to set the context, in 1947, we, we got independence. Uh, at that time, around 1,500 villages were electrified in India. Of course, electricity in India reached almost a uh, couple of years after electricity was first introduced in UK and US. Um, so, and uh, it was first demonstrated in Kolkata, then Calcutta, uh, this one. And at that point of time, it was a DC electricity. And at around the same time in, in Crawford Market in Mumbai. So around, around 1897, if I remember correctly, around that, around that time. And then there are a lot of uh, work that went on. In, initially, it was DC electricity. Then it was then it became AC electricity. Uh, first electricity uh, act was passed in 1903 and then the major act was passed in 1910. Uh, and then in 1948, we had the, uh, on the in, in, in independent India, the first act was passed, uh, that was the Electricity Supply Act. So, so starting from 1947, 1500 electrified villages to now to almost 600,000 electrified villages, which you can say almost all villages have been, all census villages have been electrified in India uh, from less than 0.3% of population coverage and that too in the urban areas to near universal electrification. Now, uh, it was less than 200 megawatt generation capacity in 1947 to almost 390,000 uh, generation capacity now. Uh, the first uh, generation plant, in fact, was a micro hydro power plant in, in Darjeeling, uh, which incidentally is still running. Of course, it has been made into a heritage uh, micro hydro plant, uh, but it is still operational. And it was established in 1897 uh, to 100 gigawatt of renewable energy capacity, which was achieved last year. More than 100 gigawatt solar capacity installed or under installation. Uh, around roughly around 50 gigawatt has been already been installed. Uh, these figures are from 2021. So there has been some increase now. Uh, and another 50 gigawatt is under installation or under the bidding has been completed and projects has been allocated. Uh, there has been improvements in network infrastructure, power markets have aided integration of renewable energy and TND losses, which used to have more than 34 to as high as 50% in some state in just before the Electricity Act of 2003 was passed, has now reduced to less than 20% in 2020 for most of the states. Of course, there are a few states where the electricity, uh, where the TND losses is still very high. So if you see the electricity consumption, and this is something, this is a figure, uh, uh, this is a metric which normally is being used by most energy researchers and, and, and policymakers across the world, which uh, uh, that if the electricity consumption is high, it appears that the country is developed. I don't buy into this entire thing because electricity consumption uh, may be high that or may be low because energy efficiency is very important nowadays. So it can be low, but still the country could be developed if the energy efficiency is taken into account. But still, since it is an universal metric being used, and you can see from 1947, it was hardly a little more than zero. and now it has reached to around more than 1200 kilowatt hour per, per capita per, uh, per year. So which indicates that we have uh, moved from a state where we are basically a totally underdeveloped uh, nation to something where at least from the electricity metrics, we can say that we are moving towards a developed nation. Uh, this one and the progress is humongous. In in seventy years, it has it has taken place. So installed capacity, if you see in nineteen forty seven, it was hardly anything, but in two thousand uh, twenty one, is almost three hundred ninety gigawatt. Out of which one fifty gigawatt is of renewable energy capacity, which is total forty percent is from non fossil fuels. Uh, that also includes nuclear, but nuclear is very small, very less. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see the figure. Uh, and generating, but it is renewable energy is only generating roughly around 20% of the total electricity now. 
so while we have an installed capacity of 40 percent but the actual generation is around 20 percent and the reason is that renewables as you all know is intermittent in nature and you don't have uh, solar in the evening or wind when the uh, wind energy when the wind is not blowing so because of this intermittency or infirm nature of the renewables the total generation is low so so we have a challenge not just to increase the install capacity but more importantly to increase the share of renewables in the grid uh, in the in the overall energy mix in the country and and during 2016 17 and 2018 19 it averaged an annual growth rate of around 24 percent for the renewable energy sector so renewables is really increasing but then how much we can increase what would be the road ahead and what are the challenges i'm going to discuss some of those aspects here in my presentation again the progress of household electrification this is uh if you see in 18, 1981, almost the entire country, less than uh, less than 40 percent of the households were electrified, or maybe less than 30 percent of the households were electrified in 18 in 1981. Uh, that's also almost uh, 40 years after India's independence. But over a period of time, since 2001, the country progressed quite a bit, and and there has been dedicated rural electrification program first for electrification of villages, and then electrification of households. And now we can say with certainty that near universal electrification achieved by end of 2020. I'm not using the term universal electrification, which the government of India uh, are using uh, uh, this one, because there may be some households here and there, some islands uh, in hilly areas, uh, in, 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 in hamlets, Majra, Tola, whatever you call them. Uh, there may be some households which may not have taken electricity uh, connection or maybe there are reliability concerns and other challenges so so better way to use the word near universal electrification and we can say with certainty that more than 98 percent of the households have been electrified uh this one if not 100 percent so it's almost 100 percent so if you see the context in 2021 now from 1947 to 2021 or end of 2020 we have achieved electrification of all villages all households renewable capacity is increasing 40% is the non-fossil fuel electricity mix in the, uh, is the installed capacity out of the total installed capacity in India. 20% is renewable generation mix in the total generation. Then, then how the context changes in 2021. So while India has achieved near universal access, uh, whether it is in, in, in terms of lighting or cooking, because almost all households also have been provided with LPG connection, uh, this one and increasing adoption, increasing in integration of renewable energy. However, providing affordable, reliable three-phase power supply and adoption of clean cooking remains a challenge. Now, there is a difference between connection and adoption. Connection is something that you have been provided, as a household has been provided with a connection. Now, that doesn't mean that the household would be using that particular energy source after getting the connection. So a household may have electricity, connection but may not be using electricity either because of reliability challenges because the household is not getting electricity supply during the evening uh, or maybe the household is unable to bear the cost of electricity and and make payment and that's why they're not they're only using for limited period of time or uh, say in case of cooking the household may have an lpg connection but not necessarily they're using the lpg for uh, for cooking all their meals they might be using lpg just for making some tea or if, if some guest is coming to the house so at that point of time uh, making some tea or something something uh, like that uh this one so so one is the connection the use the usage is the adoption so while renewable energy generation has increased fossil fuel so as i said 40 percent uh is inst uh, is non-fossil fuel renewable and non-fossil fuel installed capacity in India and only 20% is the energy mix, renewable energy mix in the total energy uh, bus basket. So fossil fuels continue and mostly coal continue to account for 60% of the total installed generation capacity in India. And that itself is a challenge because if we were to achieve uh, the net zero target by 2070, then, and if you see the progress that has taken place on a yearly basis during the last say five years or 10 years. And if I extrapolate that for the next 50 years, then it becomes a, it's a challenging. So, so I will come to that. What exactly, what, 
why I'm saying it is a challenge in, in, in my subsequent slides. Uh, India aims to reduce emission intensity of its GDP by 40% uh, by 2030 from the 2030, uh, 2005 levels and increase the share of non-fossil fuels to 50% of total electricity generation capacity. And this was announced by the Honorable Prime Minister at the recently concluded COP26 in Glasgow. So the transition, so now the challenge is that while we have transited from a traditional energy economy during the time of our independence to a modern energy economy uh, during the last decade or so, uh, this one, but now we are aiming to transition to a clean energy economy and become energy secure, resilient, and sustainable. And these three terms are the challenging terms. One, the energy security, we don't have any, uh, except coal, we don't have any other resources, energy resources in this country. So of course, renewable energy is there, but otherwise uh, this one, we are totally dependent on petroleum fuels from other countries. Uh, if we talk about solar, uh, the, the, the energy part is there, but we are totally dependent on other countries in importing the equipments which will convert the solar energy into electricity. So, so energy security is a big challenge for our country and is going to be a bigger challenge in the years to come. Uh, resilient, how much resilient we are in, in, the, in, in transition to this, uh, this one, in transition to a clean energy economy. Uh, that itself is a, is a big challenge. Of course, I feel that we are more resilient than some of the Western economies, uh, given the fact that we have a habit of, uh, better energy management practices at the household level, uh, what we have learned from our grandfathers and grandmother, uh, this one on how to conserve energy in whatever form, not necessarily the electricity, but also in other form, uh, this one. So probably we are more resilient, but still we have to see in the modern context, whether we would be resilient or not and sustainable. Though sustainable is a, is a, is a jargon being used, increasingly being used, but the real meaning of sustainability I think we all need to understand better and, and, and then try to practice that in our real life. So the transition pillars, if, you, if we see based on the Terry's work, uh, as I said, is the energy efficiency continues to increase, largely driven by technical energy intensity reduction across sectors. Renewables are emerging as the electricity source of choice from a system perspective, not just from, from the technology perspective, but from a system perspective. And renewable electricity is already cost effective in some cases and would be cost effective before 2030. So that's the, that's the positive news uh, of the energy transition process. Electrification of fossil fuel use, mostly in transport, will accelerate, especially as a system-wide cost effectiveness increase. So that is also another positive news that, is, that we are moving towards a more resilient, cleaner economy. Green hydrogen, the recently the government has announced the green hydrogen mission and green hydrogen and biomass based fuels will predominate in applications where electrification may not be viable. Uh, for example, electrification of say uh, freight transport, uh, the, the trucks may not be a viable option. So probably hydrogen would, would fill in that space. And this shift will depend on international carbon emission reduction efforts. So we need to have technologies from other countries, we need to have finance from other countries. And this is the most critical part of it. Everybody says a lot of things, but doesn't provide the type of finance and technologies that would be required for making this transition. And resource efficiency in user sectors driven by economic considerations would increase substantially and lead to further decrease in energy demand. And that's the reason why I'm saying uh, that the per capita energy consumption in today's time may not be the best metric. Of course, it continues to be a good metric because as the energy efficiency increases, you might get better outcome or output from the same input energy. And, and, that's, and this is something that we need to look forward to. So, so if you see the, uh, oops, uh, if you see the, uh, the, the energy transition towards renewable in India. So the public procurement has discovered, so we are taking the prices that has been discovered by different agencies like Solar, uh, Solar Energy Corporation of India or, or, or other, uh, so no, the energy, the, the solar parks in different uh, places in the country. So solar electricity at one rupee 99 paisa per kilowatt hour and wind electricity at two rupees 44 paisa per kilowatt hour 
are the cheapest electricity in India, cheaper than coal and any other sources. In fact, almost uh, equivalent to hydro-based electricity. Of course, I'm not talking about the very old plants, which has already lived its life. So the energy cost is almost zero there. Uh, this one, but otherwise the new plants that are being set up, hydro plants. So solar and wind are cheaper than them also, but only when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing. And that's the challenging part. Now, a small amount of somewhat farm renewable electricity, like solar plus batteries, may be available in, in 2022, by end of 2022, at a price competitive with coal electricity. And electric buses running at 25 rupees, 25 to 40 per kilometer, are cheaper than diesel or CNG buses in providing urban mobility services. And that's what the new uh, tender that has been that has been released uh, and the prices that has been discovered uh, talks about it. So our analysis in Kerry's analysis indicate that electric two-wheeler and three-wheeler are cheaper on a per kilometer basis than petrol models. It's already has, it has already become cheaper, the two-wheelers and three-wheelers. Uh, and electricity is cheaper than diesel and other petroleum products in some of the heating and, uh, and industrial application. So the solar costs have fallen by a factor of five and are now decisively cheaper than coal. And you can see the way the prices are decreased over a period of time. Uh, however, round the clock bids have delivered low prices. Uh, when I say round the clock, it's in solar plus a certain other technology or storage technologies or any other technologies, but rely more on oversizing. So most of the bids that has come, they don't offer storage as the farm option, but rather they are provide they are oversizing the plant capacity or in combining with solar and wind, they are, they are uh, bidding or, or quoting their tariffs uh, as a resource complementarity than storage. So which means that storage price is still high. And unless the storage price is, is, is reduced drastically, the way the solar price has reduced over a period of time, uh, this is going to be a big challenge for getting farm electricity. So, so we still have to depend on coal and other uh, farm electricity for for our for meeting our needs during the evening uh, this one but but the good part of it is that some analysis by some of the international organization like Fraunhofer institute and um, nrel from usa so they have found that the way india's solar uh, this one of the resources is, av is available so you have during the daytime the solar resources available and it could be at any it may not be available say during in the northeast or in the eastern region but may be available in the western part of the country during monsoon and something like that so so if you see at a macro level the 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 mean the, the common denominator that is available is more than enough or sufficient to meet the energy needs of the country this is one and two the wind energy now, again, it is done at the macro level, but if we, in case of wind energy, if we go to the micro level and, and see what is the wind availability at different points of time in the 24 hour cycle, then we see that a large untapped wind resources is available during the evening and night time. So solar and wind can become a good complementarity and some of the hydropower plants can also chip in there to provide the farm electricity in the 24 hour cycle so uh, so it need not be solar or uh, this one for the entire 24 hours but solar for 5 hours wind for another 6 8 6 to 8 hours some storage and then hydroelectricity the entire thing can meet our uh, this one or this uh, all our needs in but then we have to see the challenge would be how to integrate all these things and so this, there are technical challenges and which which we have to address so even at today's cost, RE systems are 35% 30, cheaper in India due to substitution of the fixed and variable cost. So as I said that solar has become cheaper, we need to see that how the uh, integration could be done. So because of that, this installed solar power capacity has been increasing over the years. Karnataka is, is, is the state which has the largest installed solar power capacity followed by Rajasthan. Uh, again, some people might think Gujarat has a very high a number of installation but uh, but then uh, gujarat is not a very big state and and uh, and thus it is somewhere in the middle uh, so karnataka actually has the highest installation in the country for uh, solar and that's based on the uh, ministry of new and renewable energy data 
Now the challenge is of ramping up renewable energy is now a challenge of grid integration and not affordability. The reason that prices is already uh, reduced. So now the challenge is more of grid integration. How do you integrate everything in the grid and without creating any problem in the grid? So that's the bigger challenge than the price. Maybe five years back, pricing was a challenge, but now that part of the challenge has been addressed. So some challenges for achieving 500 gigawatt by 2030. So quadrupling of the current implementation to achieve targets, almost double the generation infra in 10 years, what we have achieved in 70 years. So this is a big challenge. In 70 years, we have achieved around 300 gigawatt of capacity. Now in the next 10 years, we have to achieve 500 gigawatt of capacity. So you can understand the, the scale of the challenge. Availability of long-term finance for the project, almost two point times of what is being invested now annually in the RE sector. So if whatever is the, if X is the investment that has been made in the last five years in the RE sector, now in the next eight years from 2022 to 2030, we need 2.5 X. And that's a bigger challenge because now money is not coming and Corona has also slowed down the process. Uh, uh, this one. Discom's ability to pave to the project developers against electricity procurement unless sectoral reforms are undertaken to depoliticize and professionally corporatize the discom with proper disclosure norms in place. Now, the discoms are, are, are the weakest link and they are the one who buy electricity from the, all the power plants producer. Uh, this one, if, if somebody is investing so much of money in the renewable energy sector, if they don't get their returns and, and payments in time, they are not going to increase their capacity. They're not going to add any incremental capacity in future. So, so, so whether how we can make the discounts, uh, this one, profitable by depoliticizing and professionally corporatizing the body. So that's a big challenge because discounts are electricity has become a social good for political parties to uh, make all sorts of promises. So that's another challenge that we have to address. Large scale land requirement for RE projects without antagonizing the farming community. So, this is another challenge. That means you just cannot consider all land in India as or as major, so no, the wasteland. The wasteland also have their utility in a different way. So, in government uh, atlas, it might be registered as a wasteland, but that doesn't mean the land is a totally waste. This one. And, and wherever there are actual wasteland, there are no. Uh, getting electricity transmitted from there would add to the challenge. So, so this is an area where, again, how we can work with the farmers and, and try to develop projects in a way that the farmers are also benefited. Uh, this one, for example, agri-voltaics and other things could be, could, uh, could be a way out. But then we are yet to experiment some of those things. And in some cases, it is started to happen, but we need to scale it up. Uh, uh, this one in, in magnitude. Enhancing grid integration of renewable energy will require an aggressive portfolio of power system flexibility options supported by major regulatory and market reforms. And we are very slow in making those reforms. In 2003, Act was a paradigm change in the way electricity sector was looked at, but it's almost 20 years now to, from 2003. Uh, this one, but we didn't have any major changes in the Electricity Act after that. We are trying to do it for the last seven years but things are not changing. Uh, maybe we are not taking the right path or maybe uh, there are other political uh, challenges which the government might be facing. So, but then as a practitioner, as an energy researcher, I would say that I am very much looking forward that the uh, reforms should take place at a much faster rate to achieve many of the things that we are planning to achieve in the next eight years. Now, some urgent actions. What we are trying is that we have to also consider renewable energy to responsible energy. So formation of an integrated task force for planning and monitoring the implementation of net zero by 2070. Uh, we are still working in silos. Uh, recognize that renewable energy production being sustainable does not mean that the RE value chain is inherently sustainable. And unless we recognize this particular aspect, many of the things are not going to change. So enabling renewable energy to create value in an ecologically safe, right respecting and socially just manner. Uh, provide equal importance and develop enabling policies and financing schemes for decentralized renewables like rooftop solar systems uh, for both urban and rural areas and enable uh, solar renewable energy use for livelihood applications. 
and of course build a deeper understanding and take collective action on impacts risks threats and opportunities so so as i said so re and storage will be the economically preferred options for uh, by late 2020s by 2027 28 before 2030 penetrations of re in the order of 30 to 40 percent of the total generation i'm talking about electricity not installed capacity are are cost effective from a system perspective even after considering the additional cost of grid integration of variable re after 2030 continued progress in storage technologies will allow re share to rise above 50 percent and towards 60 to 70 at no extra cost but beyond 60 to 70 there will be humongous addition incremental cost uh, to for 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 100 percent renewables in the medium term, we'll need a portfolio of grid management options like existing gas capacity, fast ramp up and ramp down of coal power station, fast response demand reduction measures and, and storage, especially batteries. So these are some of the things that needs to be done. Uh, now the coal has been increased, has increased over a period of time till 2018. And now it has slowed down. The demand has slowed down to 1.2% per year driven by peak and plateau in power. Uh, some studies, especially by Coal India and others, uh, they say that uh, the coal demand will still be there till 2040, till 2045, and then probably it will start to diminish. So we still have another maybe uh, 20 years of, uh, of coal usage in India. Coal will be predominantly being used. But then after that, gradually it will start to diminish. And because and maybe because of that reason why the Indian Honorable Prime Minister has committed 2070 as the net zero year. So the transition and from coal is easier said than done because, uh, of course, there is no additional thermal capacity would be there in India will, will be required. But still, the transition from coal may be have technical, social, and other challenges, uh, and thus it would be a gradual process. So there is a so we are all talking about uh, just transition approach. I'm not going into detail. So there are two interlinked arguments. A transition away from coal would need to consider different aspects of justice and the goals of transition. And most importantly, in India, there is not one coal economy. And any framework of just transition must take the multiplicities of the coal economies into consideration. So there are almost some, an Australian National University, NU has done some study for coal sector in India, and they say that uh, there are at least four to five different coal economics. Of course, the national coal, which is the formal sector, it's employed 450,000 work workers, but there are subsistence level coal. There's a national coal at the informal level. There's a state craft coal, and there's a neoliberal coal. So these are also different types of coal economies and which also employs large number of workers. And we have to take into consideration all this before we actually can move away. I was told by the ex Coal India chairman uh, that there are 100 coal mines in the Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, and that belt, which Coal India is losing money every day. But just because there are a huge number of workers being engaged in those coal mines, they just can't left these coal mines, uh, this one. Otherwise, they could have saved that money. So, so now there is no mining happening there, but everybody is, all coal workers are being paid their basic uh, sort of minimum subsistence salary. And as and when they retire from their services, no new workforce is being added. So, and they will, and it will take about another 10 to 15 years for everybody to retire from services from these 100 coal mines. So, so you can understand the type of challenges in a, in a welfare state like India. So it is easier said than done to transit from coal to a renewable energy sectors overnight. That means it cannot be done overnight. Uh, another aspect from rural electrification is the willingness to pay in the rural areas. Now, we did some study a uh, few years back and, and we found that while there is a willingness to move from kerosene to minimum basic lighting and so somebody is spending so 60 rupees in kerosene is willing to pay say, 150 rupees for basic lighting. But from basic lighting to appliances used, the willingness to pay is very less. And the reason is that uh, income inelasticity plays a big role in, 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 in transitioning from basic lighting to appliance-based uh, electricity for a fan, TV, or any other thing, because the consum power consumption increases and, and the 150 rupees might become 500 rupees, uh, this one. And, that is, and the type of income 
uh, in uh, the sort Indian rural population have, uh, as per the NSSO survey, they said that almost two third of the population have five, less than five thousand rupees income per month. And if you assume that they would be spending say thousand rupees in LPG and another five hundred rupees in electricity, I think we are we are uh, we are expecting too much. This one. So unless the income increases, this is going to be a challenge, and that's why the willingness to pay continues to remain low. Now we might have provided electricity collection uh, connection to everybody in the rural areas, but whether they are going to sustain it over a period of time, unless targeted subsidy is being provided, that itself would be a very challenging task. So in the agricultural sector, this is another area which is which can do a paradigm shift in the way the electricity sector is is now. So photovoltaic based agricultural pumping is already cost effective and will be the preferred option, especially as excess electricity is bought from farmers. Now, if you see this uh, figure, you can find that uh, at three rupees per kilowatt hour at what ESL is providing to Maharashtra state electricity discount, the notional price of electricity from grid based electricity is almost six to seven rupees. Against that, they are providing electricity from solar at three rupees per kilowatt hour and thus solarizing the feeder. So this particular program of solarizing agricultural feeders has can actually transform the entire electricity sector from a subsidized loss making sector to a non subsidized profit making sector. But the challenge would be how fast we can do it. And again, finance financing would be play a big role in in uh, in, in getting to that uh, place. Now, in the transport sector, as I said, two, two wheeler and three wheeler and buses are already cost effective and will be preferential urban choices. Uh, electric trucks, long distance trucks, and electric four wheelers will continue to be a challenge, and I will come to that why. So, so different electric buses and two wheelers are less expensive than petrol and diesel. That's what many studies and also the actual uh, bidding has uh, the price that has been discovered through bidding uh, is bringing out so but if you see the cost and anxiety of the electric to ev two wheeler and three wheeler battery replacement service maintenance requirement cost charging facilities these are the most in the anxiety level these are at the top of this one so so if somebody has to want to buy a four wheeler or a three wheeler they will see that where i'm going to change my battery where i'm going to charge my uh, electric car. So you might give subsidy for the electric vehicle, but unless the charge facilities are created across this, the different cities and rural areas, uh, the transition is going to take time. Uh, so some challenges for EV uptake, high upfront cost and lack of charging infra remains critical issue hindering the uptake. Not all vehicle manufacturers possesses common battery specification, creating challenges for battery swapping. And this is something extremely important. Now in India, the bat, the swapping is something like the uh, like the water dispenser, the bisleri water dispenser that everybody uses. This one, now that's only cost 150 rupees is the or 100 rupees is the security amount that you have to provide. Uh, this one now in case of a battery swapping, it will be almost 200,000 rupees would be at stake if somebody takes the battery and the charging infra is not standardized. And next time when you go and swap the battery and they gave you a non-standardized battery and which you cannot, which another charging station is not going to take, then how come uh, this, uh, this one of somebody who is owning a four wheeler is going to put his 200,000 rupees in stake, uh, this one or 100,000 rupees in stake, depending on the battery capacity. So this is something is extremely important that all charging station should, should not only be standardized, but also branded. So that if I go to a BPCL charging station and then the IOCL charging station is going to accept the battery that has been provided to me during swapping with a BPCL charging station. So, or any private charging station by Reliance or any other is going to swap that battery that has been provided to me by another charging station. So this is this standardization and branding has to be done. Otherwise it is easier said than done in, because in Indians are very touchy about economics uh, this one they will ask 20 questions before giving 150 rupees for bisleri water bottle dispenser this one and, and it's about 100000 and 200000 uh, this one so i feel this is something going to be a big issue in in near future unless government takes steps uh, difficulty in locating charging stations by drivers implementation of weaving charging station in housing societies and institutional sites now the government is a policy but not all buildings are 
uh, I don't know what about the experience of all the all the listeners here, those who are uh, present in uh, here. But I have a feeling that wherever I have visited the housing societies in Noida or Delhi, not one char society has a charging station infra. Uh, I'm not talking about the older societies. I'm talking about societies which has been which are coming up in the last two years, three years time. That means the houses, uh, the some of the the occup uh, the houses are being handed over in the last one year or two years time, including my society. This one, so they just put a, a 15 ampere plug point. And it goes to nowhere. There is no connection, and just to show, take some pictures and get a green building rating. They will they, they will do all such sorts of juggleries, and that doesn't mean that you can charge your vehicle there. This one, no. So if you have to have so many so many EVs, swapping alone will not serve the purpose. So you have to have charging infra. And how we are enforcing the policy? The municipalities are enforcing the policy. I don't know. That means I have serious doubt about that. Whether the municipalities actually know about these policies is also another question. So the policies in itself is fine by the central government, but unless the policy flows to the final enforcing agencies who are to enforce these policies, things are not going to change. And that's the challenging part. Electricity Act was there. And Electricity Act, along with the Electricity Act, the National Rural Electrification Program was launched in 2005. And that's why we have electrified villages in the country. All villages have been electrified by 2018. And then the Sobhagya scheme was launched. And because of that, all households have been electrified. So a policy in itself doesn't have any teeth unless this comes with implementation guidelines and informing the agencies who are to enforce the policy. And of course, innovative business and financial models for EVs and setting up charging in infra continues to be slow. There's also knowledge gap, as I already mentioned. So in sum, uh, if you see the assessment of the energy transition, uh, so renewables will continue to be the overwhelming source of capacity addition for electricity generation in India. Coal demand, demand may rise till 2020s, late 2020s. However, need for additional thermal capacity may be deemed. Farm cost-effective RD would be viable by 2030. That's the good part of the story. However, the speed of price reduction of batteries will determine when these occur. So we know that it is going to happen around 2030, but whether it will take place by 2028 or 2032 will all depend on the speed of price reduction of batteries. Almost all, more than 80% new vehicles in urban areas in 2030 are expected to be electric based on the modeling exercise that has been done or based on hydrogen and fuel cells. But again, it will depend on the charging infra and some of the challenges that I just highlighted. Gas-based cooking, LPG and PNG, and electric cooking will be dominated by 2030. However, we are not clear about, as I said, the speed of EV transition in the rural areas. In urban area, it will take place, but in rural areas, we are not sure. Uh, so all the junk vehicles of the urban areas will go to the rural areas and continue to emit pol uh, pollution. So it is not going to solve our purpose. So, so we have to do it in a, in, a, in a more holistic manner. The speed of transition to electric cooking. Again, we have expanded the grid to all the, all the rural areas, but the electric lines are not, do not have the adequate capacity to, to support electric cooking in the rural areas. So again, we have to change the infrastructure for us to support the electric cooking. And that could have been done at one go, but again, pricing is a big concern. So that would have increased the price by almost double. Uh, this one. So we have spent 64,000 crores for creating this electricity infra. Uh, if we were to create an electricity infra for electric cooking, then probably we need another 100,000 crores. Uh, this one. So that's again when the government will do. It is for the government to take a call. And nature and speed of the energy transition in the industry sector, especially in the cement industry and steel industry, whether uh, uh, this one knows. Uh, Cement is one of the critical areas. That means there are not technologies available for uh, addressing the, uh, the, the CO2 emission from the, from the cement industry. Green hydrogen probably can help for the steel industry, but cement remains the critical part of it. Uh, in the rural areas, despite near universal electrification, income constraint reduces elasticity of the user to support higher consumptive load. So energy efficient device promoted with incentives and DSM to keep monthly electric charges low will be the key. I hope EESL and, and such type of organizations can do something here. Uh, 
PV based electricity, uh, PV electricity based agricultural pumping would be dominant before 2030. But we are not clear about the level and the speed of penetration. Again, that will depend on uh, how the state are going to accept this as a model and the farmers are going to accept this as a model. Uh, PV based agri uh, pumping is already cost effective. And there's a potential to revitalize the finances of the distribution sector, thus contributing to faster energy transition. Now, if the discom start earning money and, 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 and makes profit, then they can also invest a part of this profit for, for speeding up the process of energy transition. And that's why I feel that making the discom profitable should be the first agenda of any government and then other things will automatically follow. So, so I propose this future of the electric systems in India and across the world. So, so while we all talk about the 3D framework of decarbonization, decentralization and digitalization. So I feel that we also have to add two and other Ds here. Uh, the 6D being my name itself is the widget. Uh, this one. So democratization of the grid so that the peer to peer trading is going to change the way electricity uh, market has developed developed over the years, or the electricity sector has developed over the years in India and this one. So when I talk about peer-to-peer -peer trading, is that every household will have uh, will become a prosumer, or most households will become a prosumer, and they can actually trade between themselves. So you have a platform like a stock exchange where there are certain brokers who can register themselves in the in, in the platform, and they can facilitate the trading by say a retailer like uh, like an individual household with the distribution company, a distribution company with another distribution company or a retail or a consumer with another consumer, uh, this one, or a prosumer with another consumer. So, and, and, and if that has to happen, that would be the true deregulation of the markets that, that we all talk about in the Western economies and including in India, all experts talk about deregulation. But to make the deregulation happen, it has to be first democratization of the grid. Unless that happens, deregulation cannot take place and electricity markets cannot develop. So I stop here. And if you have any questions, anything, then I'd be happy to answer those. Thank you. Thank you, Devujit, sir. Uh, I would uh, take the privilege to rename it as a 6D framework, definitely. Uh -huh. uh, so can't help it. Yeah, def definitely. Sorry, no, it, it just went as a breeze. I mean, not a single second could have like uh, moved, maneuvered in it different you know way altogether uh, because i think focus was here the main focus that you have emphasized mostly is that identification of the grid which is like the basics which is uh, you know the basics if you don't put the infrastructure in place things are not going to work accordingly whatever plan we do have uh, the right infrastructure correct and so you know 2030 the way you have emphasized that it shows that you know how uh, it, you have actually emphasized that how positive news would be coming in because with the cost effectiveness different forms availability so actually it's like with the un you know sdg goals 2030 this is something which actually we're looking forward for and uh, yes uh, you know there is one more point which was uh, which needs to be mentioned there is the 2.5 times the funds needed so that's something which is an eye opener for this 500 gigawatt by 2030 uh, and uh, yeah so that is one one of the points which we need to emphasize sir i see a prospect which you have mentioned with the states that you have shown in the chart is wherein we i did not notice all of us so a couple of them has been doing remarkably good like you have talked about karnataka wherein other states were having no presence so maybe possibly there are opportunities so, uh, you know, a lot of things, a lot of things which I could have gathered here, but, you know, quickly, so I have questions uh, which I have to actually, uh, you know, ask you from the audience altogether. So the first question is, sir, it is like that way is that India is taking a lead in solar energy. Will it be a game changer in the future? Yeah, of course, India has rightly taken the lead. And as, as I said, some uh, some surveys, some studies say that India has the uh, the uh, privilege of having solar uh, energy across the year, unlike uh, Germany and, and USA and others when there's a peak during certain time of the year. And then during the winter, there is no energy sources available. And if they can achieve almost 50% or 60% of the electricity mix, uh, renewable energy mix in their total, so India can definitely do that. Uh, this one, India also the added advantage that uh, that we had a huge experience of implementing different type of solar, not necessarily on the grid based solar. Uh, many 
in the audience might not know that the first grid-based solar plant, that's a 10 kil 100 kilowatt plant, if I remember correctly, yeah, was implemented in 1992 in, in Odisha, uh, sorry, in Uttar Pradesh, in one in Mao district, that was the Dad and Power Minister's constituency, and another one in, in, uh, in Aligarh, I think, that was the Dad and Chief Minister's constituency as a demonstration purpose. So things in India, we have started moving towards solar from the 1980s, starting with decentralized solars. And as I said, grid connected solar in 1990. So it is not something that is taking place now. What is missing is that we are not learning from those experiences, what mistakes we had done at that time and how we can make those changes and this one. And if we can do that and, and India can also uh, share these lessons with many of the sub-Saharan African countries. So because they are, uh, solar resource and India solar resource are almost, they are also in the tropical region. We are also in the tropical and equatorial region. So it's almost same. So there's a huge opportunity for India for not just to solarize its entire country, or I would say uh, use renewable energy for the entire country, so whether it is solar, wind and other sources, but also take these lessons to the African countries because they also face a similar challenge of financing, low cost and all these things which we have been facing. So solution to Africa is not from the Europe and the Americas, but from India. Awesome. Awesome. It's an awesome. Sir, uh, just a thought. Uh, do, do having India having a, a huge coastline, do adds up to the, uh, you know, our advantage? Yeah, of course. So we can, we have not yet used the, the offshore wind energy. Of course, it costs a uh, little high than the onshore wind. So we have primarily in India, we have mostly used onshore wind energy. So the entire coastline is there uh, for, for us to put up offshore wind energy systems. Mm -hmm. Germany and others are already, Denmark and others are already doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, we can have the technology and start putting up. So so again, cost is, is the concern. So as and when the cost decreases, probably we'll also start doing that. Uh, already some activities have started in Gujarat coast. Uh, this one, we can also use the huge coastline for generating tidal energy. So some pilot projects have been done uh, uh, in, in Sundarban, I think. Uh, still, we are exploring the options. And I think there's a huge scope for that. And, and uh, both Arabian Sea and, and Bay of Bengal pro provides a huge opportunity for tidal energy. This one. I, I'm not talking about ocean energy. That's another thing that we can do. But just using the tides in the two, uh, this one, uh, this one, we can do that. Okay, uh, sir, I would like to take uh, one quick question from the audience. It's very interesting, in fact, to you. One sun, one world, one grid. Is it possible? How the financing will happen? So, so I, I'm not concerned about, see, I'm not concerned about the financing. I have my always take has been that finance is not a problem if 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 you have a clean mind. This one. So now the Western countries don't want to provide finance. That is all political. Now if they really want to provide finance, they can do it because at the end of the day, if your project is viable, then the banks will put money and they will earn money from there. Money is not to be kept in uh, this one in, in 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 lockers. It has to be invested somewhere to create more wealth. So I think finance is not the big issue. The issue is, uh, is what is the model, technical model that you are going to propose? Are you, whether this one sun, one grid, one world, one grid, will, will this also include, uh, are, we, are, are we going to connect the entire world through a grid, including uh, having this big, uh, this one, high capacity electrical wares under, in the, uh, going underground in the, in, under the ocean? Or the concept is fine, but we are also going to consider, say, uh, localized grid, internationalized grid, and internationalized grid. If everything is part of it within the bigger concept, I am fine with it, uh, this one. But if we are thinking of actually physically connecting the entire world with a grid, then probably I am not very fine with it. Uh, this one. So, so I don't know the technical model. Once the International Solar Alliance and other entities they come out with the technical model, I think we will be in a better position to comment on it, whether it is a more vi viable or not. At least we can hope for it, sir. Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But it's a good proposition. It's a good idea. Uh, this one. The whole idea. Of, uh, I remember way back in uh, 
early 2000 i think if mm-hmm. i remember correctly early 2000 or around mid 2000 uh, you all know many of you might be knowing dr dr sp ganchodri who was then the director of the west bengal renewable energy development agency and a special secretary in the west bengal government uh, this one now he had actually proposed a similar concept for connecting the all the south asian countries the idea was that or rather the south asian and east asian country the idea was that that when the sun is shining in say uh, in indonesia hmm. uh, this one then maybe at that time in india it is still dark but but when the sun is shining in afghanistan this one no in in Mal- in in myanmar or in thailand the sun is not shining but then we can tr- actually transmit electricity during that time this one so if we connect all these asian countries the south asian and the east asian southeast asian countries then we can be electricity can be traded and solar electricity can be traded and everybody all countries can provide electricity i think this one sun world world is a is a step up from that concept on the uh, this one so so i'm sure uh, things should be done for the good okay uh, sir with that uh, you know we are just closing on on the time with that we come to a wonderful closure because we are looking forward for a wonderful world ahead uh, to be connected with each other with you know all these conservation techniques that we can do to save this world all together sir um, it's a very big thank you from our side to take your time out and be with us amongst us with giving us enriching us with so much of information which was much needed and much an eye opener for us so a big thank you from the conference team from all the audience all together thank you sir thank you so much dr bhattacharya and thank you everybody thank you for listening and in case you have any queries any questions i am sure you might have noticed my email id and you can just mark a mail to me and i'll be happy to re- respond thank you thank have you. a nice thank day you. thank you dr thank you okay um, we now move to the next uh, phase of our conference we have amongst us uh, roma balwani uh, we are privileged to have roma ma'am amongst us as an invited speaker um, let me now introduce take the privilege in fact to introduce all of you with roma ma'am she is a senior advisor and former president communications and brand uh, from the very renowned vedanta group and ma'am is also an independent director of john cockrell india chairperson csr and nrc committee uh same with john cockrell india former president group communications sustainable development and csr member of the group executive committee vedanta resources limited she is also and this is this is wonderful to be focused she is also an advisor of the deaf cricket society uh, wonderful ma'am uh, ma'am has a graduate in economics with a post graduation in marketing from mumbai university is a, is is from the indian hub she is from the indian hub of the world leaders in the conception manufacture and installation of reversible cold rolling mills headquartered in belgium she has over 3 decades of experience in various aspect of strategic communications so in a previous role as a president group communications of sustainable development and vedanta resources she has been responsible for driving group communications sustainable and csr as a strategic functions across the group prior to joining vedanta she was the chief group communication officer of mahindra group india now in vedanta her key portfolios included sustainable development brand management stakeholder engagement in group communications to promote vedanta's position as a purpose driven organization much proactive work ma'am to emphasize to appreciate definitely and of course again we are very happy to have you amongst us uh, i would leave the floor to you to address the audience thank you so much thank you uh, dr patacharji it was indeed humbling to hear my profile uh, i must say that today i was hearing the learned colleague before me uh, a lot of technicalities in sustainable develop- development has emerged within india and globally and which we i think are leading as a country and that uh, heartens us though we are a coal fired e- economy there's many many such initiatives that the country is taking and the private sector is taking but uh, there are many organizations who still have to understand 
how sustainable development works for every industry or every sector. And I think I will just go back to basics because you all have been hearing a lot of technical uh, uh, you know, updates which are very, very relevant for the, the country today. We are an economic super powerhouse. So that is becoming very relevant. And our prime minister has also said that he would like to see a climate change taking uh, a more of a headline rather than a subtext. And that is something which has enthused many organizations to move from greenwashing to really go green. And that seems to be the, uh, the process that uh, forward-looking organizations are taking. So for me, this uh, personal journey has been to learn, unlearn, and relearn because uh, there are many such facets of sustainable development which go into various phases in, in the life cycle of business. And that is something I would like to touch upon for this audience. I hope there's no repeat in it, but if, it, if there is, please, uh, I apologize because I haven't heard the earlier presentations. But I think what is important is that uh, learning comes from nature. And, and this learning today is very relevant for planet Earth. And that is something that we have tried to understand and bring into practice in a responsible business model. So once again, thank you, uh, the uh, KJ Sumaya management team for inviting me. I hope I can do justice to your uh, uh, profile of audience and uh, take you through a little bit of practicality that every organization faces and the phases that it has to go through when they are going through their journey of sustainable development. So with that, if I can get the slides up, Parvind. So I just made this uh, uh, slide and Arvind asked me, why are there dots after the ES and why is there a G away from the ES? And I told Arvind that I will, uh, you know, uh, unravel that as we go along in my presentation. So let's take the next slide. So for all the people that who have been hearing such uh, uh, in, uh, you know, inputs on, on uh, technical papers and uh, white papers on, on uh, energy transition in, in any uh, phase of any organization or a country, more uh, uh, for a sovereign uh, country. For us and in any organization, be it small or big, where are the three elements that we look in terms of sustainable development? I think every company uses energy and resources Every company affects and is affected by the environment and the consequences of living as a result. So every organization has to really operate under a broader, diverse society. And for me, what is important and what I learned, that governance is in the heart of responsible business, which actually translates to effective decisions, risk mitigation, but it needs much more attention eventually for value creation, which is why I separated the G, Arvind, for your benefit, that when we look at ESG, governance plays a very important role for value creation. Let's go to the next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, that it is to go beyond the limited definition, understanding governance, risks and opportunities in decision making is very critical as poor governance practices have created many a corporate scandal many of us know how it has impacted because people have possibly greenwashed and not really paid attention to the uh, process that they have to implement within the organization and the current uh, research alludes that companies do rank well uh, below the average on good governance, that's been unfortunate. And this includes that organizations' purpose, the role and makeup of boards, the shareholder rights, and how corporate governance are measured takes a very critical, important aspect for good governance. We have seen in the past that uh, a company like uh, VW had an emission scandal. And that emission scandal came up because they were manipulating the, the emission standards. Now, those kind of manipulations sometimes uh, lead to, to even brand erosion. Being a communicator, it's very important to understand 
that whenever you're looking at sustainable development, you're also looking that it brings in brand value. And that is something all of us should be aware of and we should be focused on while we bring in the right practices within the organization. Can I take the next slide, please? So what I see that when you have a, a, a focus on uh, environment and social performance, what G does, the governance does, it brings in strong value creation. It helps companies to tap new markets. It helps expand existing ones. And with strong environment and social proposition, superior performance in ES, really pays off even in, in our kind of sector, which is the mining sector. Research also indicates that companies that were perceived beneficial by public and social stakeholders, when I say public and social stakeholders, your community becomes a very vital part of your journey of sustainability because they are the ones who will help you run your organization efficiently without derailing your operations and they are the ones who are actually the custodian of your social license to operate. And you are then allowed to extract resources, which is true for a mining organization like Vedanta. Now, these companies also uh, demonstrate a lot of higher valuation than competitors who have lower social capital. So that's why social performance becomes a key element when we are looking at environment to balance it. And the governance that we need to bring in, which is, which is supposed to be very robust because a CFO will look at governance and he will say, why ES? Why social performance? Why environment? But the payoffs are very real. When, uh, you know, let me take an example of Unilever. When it uh, came out with Sunlight, a brand of dishwashing liquid, which uses less water, other water saving products in their product line got a boost and sales increased by 20%. Now that is an example how a product differentiator using sustainable uh, measures can impact even the, the sales, right? You know, I have lived in Norway and Norway is one of the first world countries. It's, it's a very rich country. And I used to very often visit Finland. And one of the companies there, which I saw is a company called Neste which is a traditional petroleum refining company, a 70-year-old company with its own brand standing. Now, today, with all their sustainability measures, which they have taken, two-thirds of their profits come from renewable fuels and sustainability-related products, which is a sea change from where they started while they are in the petroleum refining business. So this is the way people impact their own business models, and they evolve their business models in today's context. Can I take the next slide? So I will not read from the presentation, but I hope uh, it, the people can see that because uh, these are the things which it impacts, whether it's credit rating, whether it is any financial implication, it does impact very positively. Now, very importantly for a CFO to understand why it is important to have good governance in ESG uh, platforms that we work on is to see that the, um, in, in our, uh, the energy consumption, what is it that we do within our processes to build uh, better productivity with lesser resources is that it links their cash flows to the organization and the value creation happens very clearly, one on top, top, top line. So if you look at top line growth, strong ESG measures, processes with public perception backed by analytics gives companies access, approvals, licenses that can trigger growth. So for a group to look at this, we did that very closely and our CFO measured it in that context, the governance mechanisms that we have in the country. Uh, that, that we have in our organization. And through the social license to operate that I mentioned earlier, which also means for a regulated industry like ours, government relations and strong community connect. This is how we facilitate and make sure that the business 
is run responsibly, uh, responsibly, it reduces cost, it also minimizes the whole regulatory process in terms of legal interventions, compliance, risk mitigation, and most importantly, it also creates uh, employee motivation because there's a higher purpose that they can uh, work towards or they align towards. So I think for each of these, if you want to optimize your investments and capital expenditure, the way to go today is bringing in uh, the ESG practices right into the heart of your business. And I think that's very important. So each of these five links create the, the uh, let's say the energy behind the, the, the uh, business process that we all are familiar with, whether it's a traditional business model, and then we bring that into a sustainable business model. So this, this requires, the first step is to realize value begins by recognizing the opportunity. I'll take uh, one example of 3M, which long understood that being proactive about environment risk can be a source of competitive advantage. So the company has saved 2.2 billion since introducing what they call pollution prevent pays the 3p program in 1975 i heard the gentleman say that we've been into this business way before many people even thought of uh, uh, you know looking at the planet earth and what we are doing to it and how we are impacting nature so improving manufacturing processes redesigning equipment recycling and reusing waste of production was what they endeavored to do. Another such a, uh, example is of a water utility company. They achieved a cost saving of $180 million per year, thanks to the lean initiatives that they undertook in improving what? Preventive maintenance, refining spare part inventory management, and tackling energy consumption and recovery from the sludges that they produced. So these are very good examples that we can see really creates value. What's important is that you, you are in the process of value creation and, and having your robust processes enables that very effectively. FedEx, if you take them, they aim to convert the 35,000 vehicle fleet to electric or hybrid vehicles. To date, 20% have been converted which has already reduced fuel consumption by more than 50 million gallons. So I think these are things that everybody looks at in terms of how do they uh, uh, want to create an opportunity for value creation. I think the opportunity, if you recognize and you address that, that's the first step for value creation. Can I take the next slide? As I said earlier, that uh, it affirms our business commitment. It has shown that uh, uh, ESG-oriented uh, investments has worked very uh, well and it has risen. You're seeing that the global uh, investments now have reached some very good numbers, 30 trillion up by 68% since, uh, sorry, 2014, that was a misprint, and tenfold since 2004. So any strong ESG can safeguard an organization, but it has to be long-term and it also then correlates with equity returns. And that I think is something that a CFO's delight that now we see uh, even every leadership uh, profile of an organization interested to be part of this journey. Can we take the next slide? So we are talking about how processes work, but processes don't work without uh, humans. And humans look at things very differently. Leadership profiles are different within any organization. People look at ESG in different parameters, which relates to their own business. How do you bring the leadership together? And how do you harmonize the value creation with a single purpose of how these five links of value creation, which are now uh, in hard numbers that you see, 
but the, the softer side of it, which are not really present in a traditional model. So how do you look at foresight to flow from the bottom line and learning from the tailwinds? I think the tailwinds of sustainability actually give you the opportunity. For example, in China, the country's imperative to combat air pollution is forecast to create more than 3, mil, uh, 3 trillion USD in investment opportunities up to 2030, ranging across industries from air quality monitoring to indoor air purification and event and even uh, cement mixing. So manufacturing processes can benefit out of the sustainable measures that an organization takes from the tailwinds of sustainability. Let me take the next one. So when I say get specific, get practical, get real, it means business needs to satisfy needs of customers, employees, and communities. Often global communities to maximize value creation. This means that thriving businesses concerned with long-term horizons fuel the virtuous cycle. So you have to build resilience into the business model. They create jobs for you. They increase tax revenues and raise standard of living. So ESG in turn helps generate wealth. That enforces a cost-benefit analysis for ESG investments just as companies would do for allocating capital for any other proposition, keeping in mind value creation, which is important for any organization which looks at responsible business. So when you have to build resilience, you have to build it with the leaders who can keep in mind the connection as profits and purpose are interlinked. So leaders have to change their mindset and look at Profits and uh, purpose, which should be interlinked, and especially in this world where all these aspects of environment, social, and governmental concerns are becoming high priority. So this requires extraordinary leadership and very effective communication practices. You can do good, but you need to spell that good out. Let's go to the next one. So coming to this entire business proposition of value creation, every leader or every forward-looking organization has to then uh, look at measures that can be, or metrics that can be measured. And how do you do that? So a sustainability maturity survey was conducted and a sustainability maturity index is something that many organizations focus on when they look at energy conservation, when they look at their processes to show uh, lean manufacturing or any other business re-engineering that they are working on. So the most important thing is, what is the motivation behind this business environmental decision, which is key to understand what are the activities that can promote this kind of uh, uh, you know, a process that can define your sustainability uh, processes and at what level are you in that process? There are many uh, such steps which, which you have to enable and then you can uh, devise a mechanism where you yourself, as per industry standards, look at what is it that uh, is motivating you to look at your environment and social performance. In the beginning, we see that activities are entirely driven through external market forces, whether it's regulation, whether it's customer demand. But while in later stage, the company is internally driven to drive sustainable change. So that is the difference that happens for any organization which is in that uh, cycle of uh, creating that maturity within the organization. So it starts with just the activities that are uh, market forces driven, and then it comes to what the company believes in as a purpose-driven organization and is internally driven. I think that is very important. Now for that, when you're going into the, the uh, maturity index, so there are things that you have to put into action. 
you have to look at the commitments. You have to have transparency with standardized evidence-based framework for climate goals. You're engaging in science-based emission reduction targets. You're also looking at digital transformation because you know that the pandemic has accelerated that. And for us, it's very important when you're doing uh, uh, remote technology or leveraging remote technology, when we were doing our mining, there was no way we could have 100% uh, uh, attendance in our mines. But being a, uh, an organization which was supplying essential commodities, one had to create a new business model where you could use all the remote technologies and go digital. And that's how with 20% uh, of the people that were on ground, we could bring in 80% of productivity. And then the, the economy does not suffer because you are still providing the essential goods to be manufactured and you're just the, the you're part of the process. You don't build, uh, you don't uh, manufacture the final product, but your com commodity is essential for the manufacturing of essential goods which run the economy. And those don't stop. In fact, there were many things we needed when we were working from home and, and everything had to be supplied. So the entire supply chain went through a, a rigor that had never been seen before. And online sales became the, the order of the day. So for that, I think it's very important for uh, organizations like us who have to produce despite the adversity that the pandemic brought and how we did it and we, how we safeguarded our employees, how did we bring in that process uh, re-engineering becomes very, very critical and we use digital transformation. And I think that becomes the major threshold for success in sustainability. And it also brought in accountability. While talking to many people, one, one knows that business leaders and companies say that they are motivated by purpose of leadership. Now here you demonstrate leadership. Here you say that then you are in the higher rank of the sustainability maturity path. And it's when you're agile to make those changes and you can pivot very quickly. So while motivation is hard to measure, there are some hard qualifying factors that need to be met to arrive at your stages of your maturity model. And one of them, which is of prime importance, is accountability. And for that, you need KPIs. So key performance indicators for any company is very relevant to bring in for environment measures. I think that becomes very, very important for us to focus on. And uh, with that, let me just take you to some of the tenets of the uh, Sustainability Maturity Index in the next slide. A very simple measurement index actually shows where we are. Every organization looks at being compliant. So there is a life cycle. You meet legal and policy requirements. You monitor any emerging risk issue. Then companies progress to being efficient. So you protect and increase market share and enhance your brand value. Many companies are at this stage. While they may say that they are leaders, it's not easy to be a leader in, in, in sustainability till you've gone through these processes, which may be layers and, and a time lag which will happen when you start from being a compliant organization to becoming an efficient organization. And to reach that, there are many, I'm sure many of your learned colleagues must have told you that there are many such enabling measures that uh, companies have taken, the government has taken, which helps you go beyond compliant and get into the efficient mode. And, and young companies, startups have to look at how they can progress very quickly and transition from compliant to efficiency. I think these are the two levels which are the ground, uh, uh, you know, groundwork that every organization has to do to be able to move to an optimized level. When you come to an optimized level, like big organizations look at, depending on the service uh, they are providing or the sector they are in or the, or the product they're producing, they have to increase their productivity, boost innovation, reduce cost, and mitigate the risk 
uh, at the same time. And how does that happen? It happens with all the sustainable measures that have been put in place when they were compliant. Earlier, it was just assurance. It was a tick box. Later, it became a very important value proposition. It became how you do business responsibly. How do you get your cash flows in place? And how do you really translate that into becoming a purpose-driven organization? If you reach that stage, which takes a lot of time for many organizations, you then can be looked at as a leader. When you are a leader, you are a leader in the sector. You are shaping the future. And you have moved through all the stages of compliance, environmental KPIs are in place, and they are delivered with minimum legal requirement. And that helps you become very efficient, very optimized to be able to take a position of a leader in the sector that you're in. There are many organizations striving to be there. And I think we are on the right path because there are a lot of enabling uh, uh, you know, measures that are being taken by the government and by the private sector to do that. Now, the most important uh, thing in all these, as I said, is the KPIs. Now, how do you define these KPIs? There have to be, you know, you have to declutter. There are so many KPIs that you've been having in an organization in a traditional business model. But for this uh, environmental KPI, you must bring it down, break it down, because you'll do many things on environment, many things on social performance. But what is it that strongly influences you to, to be motivated are the KPIs that you would put in place and they should not be more than three. If you go beyond that, then you're not able to really do justice. And these are KPIs which are very relevant and are defined for every decision making at every level. So the responsibility for the leaders and the considerations that they have to take, which are for environment, have to outweigh economic uh, considerations. Now, that is the difficult part. Many businesses do compromise on that, that they have an economic consideration. How do they balance that? That becomes a leadership value proposition that brings in the, the way the organization looks at being a purpose-driven, responsible business. And where does that lie? It lies with the right kind of ownership that you have. Who owns, owns your sustainable uh, KPIs. Who's driving the sustainable KPIs? Who's the uh, who takes the uh, you know the who's the last word for it? And how do you reach those KPIs is very very critical critical in in today's context. So with that, let's go to the next uh, slide and uh, let's understand how the leadership have to now integrate ESG into their uh, company strategies. When companies understand the importance of setting targets and sharing performance with shareholders, customers, and public, and they are sharing the way that they are changing their, their business practices, that becomes the real ESG proposition that a company can demonstrate and walk the talk. I think the private sector has uh, recognize critical risks of climate change and are committed now to be, make, to be making a change at all levels. So translating commitment uh, into practical action will actually drive results. So the gap between the pledge and practice will close when companies bega begin to map their sustainability journey and take action. Now is a time when companies can accelerate sustainability efforts that support uh, that supports automated data uh, collection and transparent metrics so that business can quickly identify strategic performance opportunities and efficiently deploy resources towards this. I think this is very important and for leadership to understand that this needs to be reported, 
So integrated reporting today has become the norm. We are seeing for the past two years, this has become very vital in terms of uh, any, any organization's reporting mechanism. And you have to set standards for science-based sustainability targets. If you do that in the right way at the right time, even when you're at a compliant stage, I think that helps you really move towards the journey of sustainability. I will take a, a small example of uh, the resources can impact people, resources can impact planet Earth, resources can impact uh, uh, communities as well as their own employees. So I think with that, I will go to the next slide. So at Vedanta, we realized that this process is, is not just lip service. You have to work towards creating the right kind of sustainability model. So yes, we took external help. Yes, we took many uh, experts, both international and uh, Indian. And both of them uh, really gave us very good insights how to do the transformation process. And they realized that our brand uh, proposition, which was transforming elements, need to now transform for good. And I think that what we realized, as I said, you have to realize your opportunity. You have to define where you can uh, leverage that opportunity and you have to create a leadership exercise. And this is what we did because giving back was the philosophy of this organization, of our organization, which now translates corporate social responsibility and the compassionate uh, communication we did during the pandemic with full focus on the ESG uh, uh, proposition that the company would like to define for itself when it gave its own uh, net zero uh, you know, kind of target of achieving it by 2050. While I think the Indian government has said that we must look at it by 2070. But all measures, right from compliant to being optimized, has been undertaken very efficiently. They will need to carry that, uh, uh, you know, uh, sustainability uh, maturity model uh, to achieve uh, their, their purpose. Because to be a leader, you have to achieve what is known as your purpose. And if that purpose is well defined, I think the organization like Vedanta or any other organization are moving in the right uh, direction. And what we did was we did, as I earlier told you, we used remote technology while we had a lot of limitations to continue with production. So digital tools, data analytics, redesigning our business processes helped us uh, a lot to create a responsible business model, which was very, very timely. I think that I feel proud about that the organization leadership, the chairman, the vice chairman, the group CEO, the entire leadership uh, team put all efforts to learn and to imbibe and to create those robust processes in place. So that's how the Vedanta transforming for good brand value is now being uh, what should I say, very prominently uh, positioned and it creates a lot of global connect. Today we are in uh, having a global footprint, a lot on sustainable measures. We have one of the largest zinc uh, producer in South Africa and there we are in a biodiversity hotspot, which is called Hamsburg. And we have taken care of the flora and the fauna over there and today we are proud to say that even the president of the country has visited that place to see how we have protected the, uh, the uh, and created measures of biodiversity and have still managed to do sustainable mining. I think that is something that uh, the organization and the company is very proud of because biodiversity, again, has a separate sustainability uh, model which you have to adhere to with global standards. And for a mining company, you have to do that so that you protect not only the environment, but the people around and the, uh, the, uh, the nature which is giving us so much. Can we take the next slide? 
So what we did in terms of positioning the brand proposition is we looked at transforming the workplace because that's how I had mentioned earlier for value creation, you need to motivate the, the employees with a higher purpose. So I think that created a whole need to recreate uh, uh, competencies. Now, a lot of training measures came in for people to understand and recreate and realign their KPIs so that sustainable uh, uh, measures of KPIs are built into their own uh, KPIs. So when that happens, you become the teams then navigate very well in unfamiliar uh, terrain and unfamiliar markets, and they're equipped to do that very well. And it's a dynamic proposition which they they learn. Uh, our whole process of uh, human capital uh, re-engineering worked, and the communication which went internal. As I said, if you want to be efficient, your internal communication has to be very, very robust. And that created the renewed energy. And that's how the organization could pivot. Transforming the communities, there is, it's non-negotiable because for them, environment is very important. And for us, we believe that the community, and in our case, it was the women and child, which was uh, uh, focused on so that you can, uh, our, our chairman always felt that you must eradicate poverty and that really starts at the grassroots level. So the project that uh, uh, Vedanta undertook, which is called uh, the Nandgars uh, across the country, and today they are, they're heading towards 4,000 such Nandgars, also have organic gardening at the back. They have water uh, supplies, which are, which are very important for any uh, Anganwadi to, to survive, for children to get the right kind of uh, nutrition. All this really works towards building a purpose-driven organization. And I think that's where social performance plays a key role that when you're extracting, you're also giving back to society and you're creating very compassionate uh, uh, communication on ground by understanding what the community's needs are and reflecting on it and giving back to them in the way that they can protect the environment and they can protect their jobs as well as create livelihoods for them. Creating livelihoods becomes very important today in a post-pandemic era that we are in, that if we don't create livelihoods in the right manner, we are not able to sustain businesses in the long run. Then our, all our environment initiatives to look at uh, uh, transforming the planet is to do, as I said, with world-class experts who came in. They, they helped us revise, re renew, re-energize our business processes. And uh, we did communicate that to the public at large. Our shareholders are an important uh, aspect of our uh, entire stakeholder community. And we want to achieve the promise of being net zero by 2050 and how we are pro progressing on that. So renewable energy becomes one part of it. Water conservation becomes another part of it. Biodiversity is something that we are very proud of and many such measures that are being taken, but we have created a very clear ESG goals format and they are only five in number. And those five are how we, uh, you know, translate our universe uh, to, to be able to do responsible business. So I think that's what Vedanta does. There are many organizations which we can be proud of. Mahindra's did that also in the past, but uh, I will stop at, at this and uh, just a small quote with the next slide, which I feel very strongly about. If it can't be reduced, reused, repaired, rebuilt, refurbished, refinished, resold, recycled, or composted, then it should be restricted, designed, or removed from production. And I love this quote from Peter Seeger, the folk so uh, singer and social activist. Thank you so much. My last slide is a thank you slide, which gives credit to uh, the learnings that we've had from McKenzie, the learnings that we've had from uh, Sfera's uh, maturity survey. So thank you again for giving me this opportunity. I hope I did justice uh, to your audience because I know there were many, many experts who were talking about technicalities, but this is the back to basics that we need to learn, unlearn and relearn. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity.
Ma'am, just to add up, you know, there is a lot of appreciations coming in the chat boxes once you were presenting throughout. You know, it's like an exciting journey, definitely. Just to reassure you how it went. Uh, yeah, uh, I need to tell you, ma'am, I'm an HR faculty here in KJ Somaya. So you can understand throughout all these slides, it has been an exciting journey for me. Glued to that, what are you saying next? What is that you are saying is, uh, I would like to sum up the way when you have taken up examples what Vedanta is doing. Uh, questions are there in my mind, I'll ask, but let me just sum up. Uh, something exemplary, which is actually pushing me back again. Though Vedanta comes in on and off during our teaching, uh, where the way we are facilitating the courses, it comes as an example too, definitely. But now it has pushed me, your, your talk today has pushed me to look more, delve deep into the exemplary work Vedanta has done. So ma'am, it's like, you know, a kind of a research paper journey which you have taken in the last couple of minutes. It's like, talking about governance practices, employee productivity, there are opportunities for value creations, which you have talked about. It's just quoting it, harmonious leadership, which you have talked about, sustainable maturity. Those are the points which just started off, you know, triggered that these are the triggers which you should think about. And then you went into the solutions, like how do you go about digital transformation, uh, accountability, yes, yes, the KPIs. You have shown that how the KPIs can be, you know, merged or can be, you know, related to the accountability aspects. It's an absolutely sweet slide which you have read, which are put in the tenets of sustainable immaturity index. It's sweet. It's actually underlined man. And uh, thereafter, you showed the solutions. Uh, now I need to mention it here is that the, the things that you have said every time you have emphasized on that, uh, keep it sweet and simple and short. The pointers, the achievement target should be something which is feasible. Keep it in, in limited numbers. So we just, we just reiterating and that makes sure that it is achievable. And that's how you have shown in through different examples. You know, my, my, my journey for the last one hour is, is you can understand that myself is getting too excited and motivated <laughs> to, to into that. Okay, uh, ma'am, I just, before I take up all the questions, is my question, I, I take the privilege to ask you first, is that uh, at some point of time, you have said, you have taken up examples of Vedanta, you have said that training you have taken up to in the, in the workplace situation to ensure that the, you, you get a team, you get an, all of them into the same floor altogether. So the question that's just creating noise in my mind is that, uh, is it that you think this these aspects of you know purpose for which is coming from within is something which you want employees who are ingrained or tuned into that you map and then you bring them into the organization or is it something you felt because you have hands or experience on that that they can be developed and then maybe they they can be motivated to work upon on the KPIs to merge it so those two uh, paradoxes in fact is going in my mind. So I would uh, compliment the, the uh, HR team in our organization, which looks at campus recruitments, but with a mindset that when they're going to campuses, they see people who have the uh, you know, ability to understand a purpose-driven organization would be something that they would look for in the, in the recruitment phase itself. When they come in, they themselves are taken through a very, very robust induction process, which actually aligns to the purpose of the organization. I think it starts right there. And within the whole leadership pipeline, Vedanta, I can tell you, is one of the few organizations which actually uh, promotes young leaders to take on responsibility, maybe far more than what their experience can give them uh, at that age. I think it's one of the only forward-looking organization which trusts the, the young leaders and the way they think. And that is, which may, that is what makes the difference to create you know, a mindset change. And as, as uh, you know, Arvind is saying, millennials work for purpose more than money, which is a fact. And for them, yes, money is important to an extent, but not beyond what they feel for the planet, what they feel for their, uh, their people, for their communities. And they are willing, and even consumers are willing to pay more for a product which goes green. 
So I think this is a complete change in terms of the thought process that we are seeing in the last, I'm seeing it for the last five years when we have been getting campuses, uh, you know, recruitment done. And we are surprised and amazed at the focus and the purpose that these young uh, people demonstrate. And today they are young leaders in our organization and they must be in hundreds, uh, which is very surprising to be given that kind of empowerment, which Vedanta offers them is incredible. And I think that helps our organization to move towards that whole training process, which really starts within the, the education system that you're in. And then it is promoted within the organization that you uh, is your destination. Now with that aspect, I just want to conclude what you were saying is that we have that onus because we are sitting with that hub of this you know, new exactly. generation. So maybe that onus lies to us to actually delve deep into that and identify those uh, you know, possibilities among these young sparks that we have amongst us and then maybe categorize accordingly so that they can actually be the spearheading, take a spearhead or they can be the one who can disseminate. Uh, so uh, maybe I'm just getting into too much into with you ma'am is taking privilege i just need to ask the questions for everybody's purpose yeah i i i need to you know there are questions there in the chat box ma'am i'll just quickly pick up to that once which is uh, which has come in is millennials work more for purpose than money will it make it easier for the next generation to implement esg continuation to what we have said ma'am that's the question that has come in i won't even look at this next generation what has happened today it is uh, the young minds, right from where they are in school, they are being understanding how we are impacting the planet. What are we doing wrong? If you see children today, they are so uh, open to what the uh, damages the older generation uh, are very critical. So once you get that critical mindset, even with children, why are we talking about the next generation? We have a generation uh, which is uh, going to be your uh, new generation coming up and they are questioning and you cannot avoid those questions. So we start young and, and if today in schools we can imbibe this and I think people are doing it, many schools are doing it and that's where the journey begins right from how we give birth and how we create that whole, uh, uh, you know, uh, life cycle for any human, any animal, any plant, any living being, I think you have to encompass it in a larger context. Then you're looking at sustainability uh, in, a, in a holistic way. Ma'am, uh, there's another question though. Is I think in similar lines, which is which I also wanted to ask you again, that how we, can an educational institute ensure uh, that the ESG part of it is taken care of and is practiced? I think once you have just just touched upon for the school part of it, ma'am, like. But this generation, which is already into maybe the college, the undergrads, the post-master degrees, how do we take care of those? I think you're doing a good job. You're looking at ESG uh, as part of your, your curriculum in terms of sustainable development. You're looking at uh, energy conservation. You're bringing in people to, to uh, expose them to what the industry is facing or, and how they are combating it. I think those are measures that you've taken. More importantly, uh, if it becomes part of your curriculum, it will only help these people get employable. What happens is many many uh, institutes are not able to make the people uh, make the uh, student employable. They make them very good in their academics, but you have to make them employable. And when you want to make them employable, this is one such uh, area uh, you should be focusing on and bringing it into your curriculum and making sure that you have a very robust uh, apprentice kind of a system where interns can go and learn on the job in manufacturing organizations uh, where, where they get the real hand experience and that is something they bring back when they, they come back to their, their own learning uh, process. So if you can bring that in, that kind of placement will really help, uh, you know, institutes like yours to differentiate from other institutes who do not take this as a very important facet of creating uh, your students to be employable. 
Wonderful. Uh, way forward, ma'am, provided to, in fact, to us also uh, in KJSIM. Uh, ma'am, so thank you so much for being with us. Uh, you know, this has been incredible for the for being, you know, you being with us and listening to you. And uh, I would then, you know, again, take the privilege to thanking you uh, and from the on behalf of the audience that it was such a uh, wonderful you know, time hearing you out. We look forward for more association with you and to hear you out more on those aspects. And thank you, ma'am. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Arvind. Thank you for being a patient, listening to my inputs. This is something I've learned over experience. I must confess that when Arvind asked me to speak about this, I said, you've got such senior uh, members of the industry, experts coming in. How am I going to uh, you know, address this audience? And I was frankly nervous. But uh, I think uh, Arvind and uh, was it Mr. Hari who had some confidence in what I would share. And thank you again for giving me that opportunity. And thank you for, uh, you know, accepting the fact that Vedanta has uh, really progressed in their ESG journey. Uh, really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, you, thank you. Thank you, everybody. God bless. Thank you.